Uh, good evening uh, were you guys aware that there was not a session on uh, 29th also 30th whatever that it was 29th sorry were you aware about that mandlik aparna can you hear me uh, yes sir sir you told that uh, it will be on first so ha uh, so it was clear right uh, okay okay we'll wait for a couple of minutes and then we'll start in the meantime if you have any uh, doubts from previous sessions um, you can ask uh, uh, we'll wait for two more minutes and then i'll begin for with today's session so that's all is my screen visible please confirm is my screen visible yes sir okay um uh, so thank you for joining um just for starters this will be the last session uh, for this phase uh, nptel uh, for the second phase so today will be the last session from me and i think other scholars may have already finished with this sessions um so that's that uh, but i might take even though it's not with nptel i might i might take one more session on the coming sunday that is just to see if there is demand but since only two people are here so uh, you feel free, you feel free to ask any doubts that you have since i can give you much better attention and try to solve your doubts so my name is amit i am a phd scholar at indian, indian institute of science um we are, we are discussing uh, the physics previous year questions uh, hosted by nptel and this is the this is a combined session for week 9 and 10 on february 1st 2023 all right uh, last class we were talking about uh, schmidt trigger which the question um, was incomplete to say the least so just a quick overview of what an operation amplifier is an operation amplifier is made up of two words so operations which operations are we talking about we are talking about some basic mathematical operations like comparison which you know greater than less than so greater than less than or equal to these are the very basic comparisons integration you know it's uh, you integrate uh, signal usually from uh, voltage from from a given 
zero time delay system time t you can differentiate using an operational amplifier and you can also perform the addition or subtraction uh, why amplifier because it amplifies the input voltage we'll see in a minute that what do we mean exactly where the input voltage is and how to get the output voltage and uh, this, uh, it is it is to be noted that the operational amplifier is subclass of differential amplifier um, so a differential amplifier is uh, as you can see on the left of your screen on the bottom left of the screen so this is a differential amplifier you have you have given a, a power supply vcc and a, a power supply ve and these are the two inputs v in plus and v in minus two two bjt's which are identical q1 and q2 and these are the resistors and we are taking the output in this form over here the difference between the uh, the collector voltages of these two bjt's and if you if you do some mathematics in this uh, the, the the expression of v out can be written in this form now it is to be noted that there are two terms here of of importance to us one is this ad term the other is this ac term and the ad term is known as differential gain while the ac term is known as the common mode gain so th so this is a differential this is a differential amplifier now how to convert a differential amplifier to an operational amplifier we need to do we need to make sure of two things one is that ad the differential mode gain should be much higher than the common mode gain mm -hmm. so effectively this term will be neglected the second term will be neglected only the first term will remain and second is that the the, the, the circuit has to be designed in such a manner that it will have a lower output impedance and a high input impedance and this is a symbolic representation of the of the same differential amplifier but when you apply these two uh, apply these changes in your design itself um, so v plus is your the positive input v negative is a negative input negative is also known as the inverting terminal or the inverting input this is called the non-inverting and as you can see over here again that vs plus is nothing but corresponding to vcc over here vs minus is vee and we are taking the v out this is the v out over here uh, this is this is a more uh, more uh, a model a more uh, better model of the ideal operation amplifier where you can see v plus and v minus and uh, the saturation voltages are given here and this is the output voltage and these are the typical uh, terms that you will come across and I have, I have summarized them over here so open loop gain is usually denoted by G or AOL idle value is infinite but really you get 10 to the power 5 output voltage similarly will be saturated at Vsat input impedance is usually mega ohms output impedance is fairly low in ohms slew rate is how fast is your circuit switching like from zero to high to low and low to high and so on the slope is what is known as the slew rate cmr i told you what ad should be greater, greater greater than ac so when you represent it in terms of decibel so 20 log ad over ac is this is cmrr this is usually 6200 this means ad is um, three to five orders of magnitude higher than ac and this this is a good cmrr and there is another representation the same thing which you have seen earlier and the, you can clearly see the uh, the the output voltage expression clearly follows the expression from the differential amplifier and this is this is a typical example where we are comparing two voltages so when v in you see this is the input where we are applying the input voltage to a positive terminal non inverting terminal and the reference voltage is over here so when the so when the input voltage is crosses the reference voltage the output swings from low to high it goes from minus vcc to plus vcc this is a comparator circuit and this is the same circuit that we'll utilize today to understand schmidt trigger and but we also provide feedbacks that are the logic so there are two feedbacks negative and positive if the output node is connected to inverting terminal by some resistor capacitor any other circuitry for that matter it's a negative feedback it's usually it provides a stabler output and examples are integrated and differentiator Similarly, if the output node you see over here is connected to the positive terminal, the non-inverting terminal using some resistor, capacitor, diode, whatnot, it's a positive feedback. It usually gives an unstable input, but we can still utilize them to, to create oscillator circuits or Schmidt triggers, which we are going to see in a while. So this is, so this is a circuit uh, that we had, uh, in, uh, you can see in the question, the circuit diagram. So what we have over here is uh, this, uh, this op-amp and input is given over the inverting terminal and we need to find the waveform for the uh, output voltage uh, for for the given input voltage the triangular input voltage waveform right and uh, so before we solve this question uh, there are some pre-checks that we should do what is that is the op-amp ideal or not because remember the all the expressions that ad equal to um, aol vd plus minus vd minus and everything else is is applicable only when the 
the op-amp is ideal so here the question is silent about it so we'll simply assume that it is ideal we'll assume that it is ideal so we'll assume that ideal assumption secondly we check what is the niche if there any feedback is present or not so we can clearly see the output voltage over the output node over here is talking to the input terminal the the, the positive terminal via this 4k resistor and hence there is a feedback so yes there is a feedback what kind of feedback it's a positive feedback finally we we, we talk about this condition called the virtual short so if we go to the previous slide over here uh, you see this that there's a there's a R in over here and R in usually we can see that the input impedance is usually very high so I'm going to utilize this thing over here right so what is virtual short so this terminal is V plus this is V minus so what I'm going to do let's say there's a resistor over here R in right and let's say there's a current I plus that is flowing in so whatever I plus is flowing it should be flowing out here also so I can write the Ohm's law across this resistor so I can write I plus times R in should be equal to V plus minus V minus simple Ohm's law if, if R in ideally we assume R in to be infinity uh, right so what what's going to happen is that these two are going to be shorted they are going to be at the same potential right so uh, the no current will flow so this will be zero so we can say V plus minus V minus is equal to zero this means V plus equal to V minus now V plus is is this is this node and V minus is this node I'll take use a different pen to illustrate the point so V plus is this node V minus is this node they're sitting at the same potential this means that's why they're called short why virtual because there's no actual wire shorting them it's just the nature of op amp is that because there cannot be any input current so these two uh, voltages have to be at the same potential these two nodes have to be at the same potential so that's what we mean by virtual short and this is a very important uh, this, is, this is a very important property of an ideal operational amplifier excuse me yeah so that's that so we'll utilize this uh, property over here uh, right so now we come back to the circuit that we were given so this is the circuit that we were given and if you closely notice that all the we need to find the correct output waveform but at time equal to zero all the output voltages are plus 10 volts you can see in all the four options right so what i'll say is that that at t equal to zero V out is plus 10 volts note plus 10 volts is the saturation okay so now let's just first try to evaluate what is the potential here at t equal to 0 just let's try to evaluate let's call this node voltage V plus so at t equal to 0 now note this is a potential divider right so to, so I can write V plus is equal to V out minus 0 the whole note that, that no current will flow here so no current will flow here similarly no current can flow here right so v out minus zero this is the total so all the current that is flowing over here will flow over this so this is essentially a potential divider right so i can write v out minus zero times 1k over 1k plus 4k this is simply the expression for a potential divider so this comes out to be v out into 1 over 5 V out is plus 10 volts at t equal to 0. So I can write V plus at 0, t equal to 0 is coming out to be 10 by 5 equal to plus 2 volts. Right. So at t time equal to 0, this node is sitting at plus 2 volts. Now at t equal to 0, we start applying an input triangular waveform. So input waveform will start from here. So what will happen is that this op amp will behave like a comparator. So this voltage, this node is sitting at I'm writing it in, in in different color just to illustrate so what's going to happen is that uh, so case one uh, when v in is less than plus two volts right this means all in this part in the purple region over here so v in is less than plus two volts and we know that so uh, v plus is sitting at plus two volts since the negative terminal is at a lower potential than the positive terminal the output will be high plus Vsat so I'll write since V minus is less than V plus V output should be equal to plus Vsat just like we saw in the comparator circuit so what is Vsat? Vsat is plus 10 volts so we can say that during this region V output will continue to be plus 10 volts so this is the first thing 
now what we'll do now we'll take the second case which i'm writing in green now so let's consider the case when case 2 what will happen when v in exceeds plus 2 volts right what will happen in this case this means i'm talking about let's say this region and onwards i don't know till what time but onwards so and so v plus again here at this instant just at this junction right v plus will be plus 2 volts again right? because the potential divider remains the same so now we can see now since v minus is greater than v plus this means the negative terminal the negative input is at a higher potential as compared to the positive terminal now v out will swing to minus v sat so v out will swing to minus v sat this means v out will swing to minus 10 volts so this means at this junction so i'll i'll draw the output wave from here itself so that it's it's easier to understand so this is the output wave form this this was the region over here and for the first part the purple part the output voltage we saw was plus 10 volts so this is plus 10 okay now what's going to happen is that at as soon as as soon as v in crosses plus 2 volts this means at this point what will happen the saturation voltage will drop to minus 10 volts so this is minus 10 this is the output waveform that i'm drawing right so what will happen is that now v set has become minus 10 right so now let's quickly evaluate so if v set has become minus 10 again so at this let's call this t equal to t1 so now at t equal to t1 what will happen is v plus again the same potential divider it will become minus 10 into 1 by 5 it will become minus 2 volts so v plus now value will become minus 2 volts so this junction will now be at minus 2 volts from this point onwards right so i'll, I'll just be more clear this is v output this waveform is for v out and now i'm going to try a, a third waveform which is nothing but v plus right so we saw that v plus for the for this part was plus 2 volts this was plus 2 volts and then at this junction as soon as v in at this junction it became minus 2 volts so this is what we saw earlier right so what's going to happen now is that this will this case will continue to be the same now the comparator will kick in again when the reference voltage goes touches the uh, when, when the input voltage sorry touches the reference voltage now reference voltage is minus 2 so now we need to identify when does the input voltage now cross the reference voltage so you can see the input voltage is now when the input voltage will cross the minus 2 volts now the reference voltage is minus 2 so the input voltage crosses minus 2 at this junction that's called t equal to t2 so at t equal to t2 this is case 3 when v in will become less than the reference voltage which is now minus 2 volts because v plus now at this junction is minus 2 volts now we can write since v minus is less than v plus now again comparator circuit will kick in the the positive terminal has a higher potential as compared to the negative terminal so v out will again become plus v sat this means plus 10 volts so what's going to happen is that at this junction at this junction it's again going to rise to plus 10 volts and similarly correspondingly v plus will also rise to plus 2 volts because v plus we know is given as a potential divider over here so now i'll just complete the green curve which was missing so it will be like this and it will be like this now what will happen is that again in the next cycle when again this time will come so so this will become this will remain high now, again when this time comes over here right so when this comes so this will this will continue to be like this and then when this time comes when again the the, the input voltage crosses the plus 2 volts because now that is the reference so the circuit will again switch as i'm denoting in green so this will again switch to like this corresponding this will again switch and then this cycle will continue so you can clearly see we have converted a triangular waveform into a square waveform uh, the the voltage limits are corresponding are accordingly decided by the 
plus Vset and minus Vset because this is this is uh, the output voltage cannot be arbitrarily high. It has to be clamped to to these saturation voltages. So this is what is happening. So the the key thing to note here is that the reference voltage changes. It's not that the reference voltage remains constant in minus two volts or plus two volts throughout. In when 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 in the po when it's rising, when the input voltage is rising, the corresponding reference voltage was this plus two volts. You can see over here. However, on the falling edge, the reference voltage was minus two volts, and so the trigger points were different. This is sometimes also referred to as hysteresis because the the the, the rising the rising edge and the falling edge have different threshold voltages. So. You should keep into mind because there are different forms of this question usually that are asked. So uh, you may want to uh, just recall that the threshold voltages are different and there's, there's different terms that are used. Some hysteresis that uh, hysteresis uh, is also this word is also used. Sorry, hysteresis. This word is also used. Multiple thresholds. There are different uh, phrases which are associated with uh, a Schmidt trigger. And of course, we saw that this is possible because it's a positive feedback circuit, unstable circuit, and hence it oscillates. You can see that it's oscillating over here. Now we'll come back to the uh, the solution. Uh, sorry, the options. So we saw that the first trigger was at plus two volts over here, and the second trigger was at minus two volts, and then again at plus two volts, and then again at minus two volts. So we'll see that. So you can see this is. Uh, this is falling at plus 2 volts which we expected rising at minus 2 which we saw in our waveform earlier again falling at plus 2 rising at minus 2 so this seems to be the correct option but let's check the other options so we must see that the the edges will be at plus 2 and minus 2 so you can see the edge is not there so this is the wrong answer uh, similarly at plus 2 and minus 2 the rising edge of plus 2 you can see this this is falling at plus two but again this is rising this is rising not at plus this is again rising at plus two but it should rise as minus it should rise over here like this option this is also incorrect similarly this point this point this means you have to consider this line this line and then again this line and then this line so you can see that these two lines are matching but this one and this one are not this is also incorrect so option a is the correct one over here uh, I'll again pause a bit and just summarize that what we had talked about. So uh, we had taken this to be an ideal op amp, and we saw that this is a positive feedback. And if if you are familiar, this is this is a typical circuit of Schmidt trigger. Now, there are two concepts that are involved here. One was the potential divider. So this is over 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 in this part. You can see this is the potential divider over here. So first thing we need to know how to how a potential divider works. Second thing was in this in I'll change the pen again. Second thing was over here, a comparator circuit. Comparator. So these were the two two concepts that were involved here: potential divider and comparator. These are the two electronic systems you can see, and we saw that the the triggers are different. So on rising as it was plus two, falling as it was minus two, and correspondingly the output. Uh, output waveform gave us a rectangular waveform or a square waveform but the triggers were different um, this is also known as hysteresis in case of a schmidt trigger so i'll pause over here for your comments or questions you want me to repeat anything uh, please ask uh, feel free to ask uh, you want me to repeat something that you uh, i have quickly went through Just, i'll pause here for a bit and ask for your comments or questions You can ask. Yeah, there are only three people in this class, so I can, uh, I've been very, uh, how should I say, intricately uh, address your doubts. So feel free to ask. All right. If there are no comments, uh, I'll move forward uh, for the next question that we have for today. So this is a very straightforward question. Okay, I should ask this first. So how many of you have, uh, of the three of you, uh, all the three have your physics background? No. Yes, sir. Okay, one no, one yes. Ashutosh? Okay, I'll assume uh, it's a no, so that I'll keep the level accordingly. Okay, so uh, have you read about capacitor charging and discharging? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Aparna? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So this question is about is a very very simple question. 
this is about charging of a capacitor so so read the question from this is a fairly old question from 2010 but it often happens that the questions are repeated in gate or not in gate like some question from just you change the uh, change the wording and it's and it appears in gate and vice versa so the question says the figure shows a constant current source we'll talk about current source in a while it's charging a capacitor so that is initially uncharged so initially so we can say that q0 this means charge at time 0 is equal to 0 it's initially uncharged it says when the switch is closed at t equal to 0 at t equal to 0 we close this switch at t equal to 0 vision of the following plot denotes correctly the output voltage of circuit as a function of time so we need to find v out what is the waveform as a function of time okay uh, sorry not a waveform v out as a function of time so we'll we'll uh, we are required to find this right but first let's look at this term what is constant current source so what is this uh, what are current sources so on the screen you can see two current sources one is ideal current source one is a practical current source on the left is an ideal current source so what it happens is that inside this current source is nothing but this the, the black rectangle that you see so what it does is that so ideal current source promises that i will output so this you can see this infinite resistance over here right so no current can flow through here so i call this i internal i internal has to be zero because it's infinite resistance so i out has to be equal to is yes, if you apply kcl over here so whatever current is being provided uh, whatever this source whatever this current source claims no current is lost inside the current source itself all of it is output to the load so we are applying some load here let's assume it's a resistive load it can be capacitive it can be anything but for the simplicity let's assume so rl so so the current that is being supplied to rl will exactly be equal to is now let's uh, analyze the same situation over here let's apply the same load rl over here okay um yeah so again the practical current source says that i'll again supply it promises to supply is let's hold on a second okay fine so uh it's uh it's it promises to supply is so let's say how but you see there's a resistor here also rp shunt resistance so what will happen is that some current will flow here let's call this again i internal and here this let's call this current as i out so if, if i apply kcl over here on this node so it will be incoming current that is 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 equal to the outgoing current outgoing current is i internal plus i out the current which is flowing through the resistor now note that it is only this current that is of importance to us not other currents just a second yeah it is only the, the the current that is being supplied to the load that is of importance because that's the whole job of a current source to provide some current but if some current is being lost so you can i'll write rearrange the term so i out will be i s minus i internal so if some current is lost inside this means this source practical current source is not as efficient as compared to idle current source now there are some 10 formula you can for instance uh, derive the power that is out here in this case and you can also derive the power in ideal case and there are some ideality factors eta ideality factor i have a video on this in uh, on my youtube channel you can refer to that if you are interested but the, but the but the summary here is that the practical current source has some inefficiencies associated with it that's the whole that's the whole uh, idea over here okay so now uh, what we'll do is that now we'll take this picture and we'll assume it's an ideal current source because question is silent about it i'll assume it's an ideal current source so whatever current is so let's say it supplies current i so there is no there's not uh, so there is no drop there is no drop over here so all the current will be supplied to this capacitor itself okay now what we are going to do is that now we need to find the output voltage across this capacitor c so let's try to do that now so how to do that we know that uh, that q equal to cv this is the famous expression for a capacitor q is the charge stored on the plates c is the capacitance and v is the voltage right so what will what i'll do is that i'll differentiate with respect to time on both sides so i can write dq over dt equal to t over dt of cv c is a constant we'll assume c is a constant so that will come out to be dv over dt now this v is nothing but the voltage across the capacitor so i can write d by dt 
this is nothing but v out minus 0 right v out minus 0 okay so dq by dt is nothing but the current flowing through the capacitor which is i so i can write i equal to c dv out over dt and what i'll do i'll rearrange the terms i'll take dv out to the left side so what will it it will be it will become i over c dt this is the expression the differential uh, equation that we had obtained i know that i is a constant because we are given this is a constant current source an ideal constant current source so i is a constant c is a constant we have assumed so, so if i integrate it so from 0 to v out no, uh, kindly note that the initially it's given uh, initially capacitor was uncharged initially capacitor was uncharged this implies q0 was 0 or we can say that v out 0 at time t equal to 0 was 0 so hence the lower limit is 0 similarly at time t equal to 0 output voltage was 0 and this is to a, to a certain time t so if i integrate it it will come out to be v out minus 0 equal to i by c times t minus 0 this will come out to be v out equal to i by c over t now what i'll do is that uh, yeah so we have obtained v out is nothing but i by c times t i is a constant because it's a constant current source c is a constant we have assumed so this is coming out to be y equal to m x y equal to mx this should be the expression this should be the and we have to simply plot this expression so you can clearly see option d matches it closely that's fine but what's happening over here y equal to mx extends to infinity it should actually go on like this but there cannot be any um, in practical scenarios there cannot be infinite uh, currents uh, infinite charge build up what will happen is that if you increase it to after a certain amount either this capacitor will blow up this capacitor will blow up also there is a there's a uh, even maybe even before that this is a volt this is a current source right usually these current sources are uh, bjt's uh, depending on what the current is but let's assume it's a b it's a bjt circuit that's providing this whatever the the value of current is right every bjt is driven you know by some voltages vcc vee so you cannot exceed a certain rated voltage whatever that voltage v doesn't matter but it will saturate at some certain point of time the reason is that either the capacitor will, will just simply blow up or the current source will hit its compliance well it's it's rated not compliance it's rated voltage whatever vcc or ve whatever it is it will hit some voltage it cannot it cannot provide uh, current endlessly so so th so that's what that's what's going to happen so ultimately this will saturate at some level which level we that information is not available but we can be certain that it will saturate at some level so hence option d will be correct it will rise as y equal to mx a straight line but after that it will saturate so th so this is the key here the, the, the saturation part so yeah so i have now finished the question um, i'll again pause for a bit uh, and um, let you just absorb this if you have any questions please ask me i'll wait for a minute or two sir um that yeah. saturation level yeah you need me to explain it again that part uh, it's not clear okay so what's going to happen is that what we obtained was that the expression should be y equal to mx this is a straight line expression and we uh, so i'll just write it again okay so we obtained y equal to mx what's going to happen is that this should be the answer actually the dotted line the dotted the red dotted line that you see why this is a straight line but that's not going to happen it's not going to happen because what this means is that the there can be infinite amount of voltage that this capacitor can store and we know q equal to cv right so if you keep on increasing the voltage this means you can you keep on increasing q over and over that's not possible because uh, these this capacitor is it has some physical limitation below which uh, above which it's it, uh, it it cannot perform optimally so so there's that's one way of saying it the other way of saying it is that you can look at the the, the current source over here 
current source over here. So th these also operate at some voltage. You see that this this node voltage will keep on increasing, right? So what happens is that the, all these current sources, which you'll see in in a in a in, in a question today itself. So these current sources cannot operate above a certain voltage because this current source is usually being driven by a BJT, bipolar junction transistor circuit. And every bipolar junction transistor circuit has some voltages which are provided to collector, let's say VCC, we note it by VCC. So whatever the voltage, so, so, so the voltage across this current source cannot be arbitrarily high, that's my point. It cannot be arbitrarily high because then either the the, the, the whole circuit will uh, will start to malfunction or this capacitor will blow up. Whatever be the reason, there will be a point at which the output voltage should saturate. That reason can be the capacitor or the current source or the combination of both. But it has to saturate. It cannot sustain uh, an, in an infinite amount of uh, voltage or you can say it cannot, it cannot store an infinite amount of charge. If this were possible, a very small your your phone batteries will last for centuries if this were possible that, that that's not the case that's not a practical case so, so that's what i mean by that it will saturate clear sir okay thank you um so what i'll do is that i'll now move on to the um next question right so we talk i just touched upon the bjt's over here so this is a question from like 10 12 years ago the question asks which of the following statements is correct for a common emitter amplifier circuit. So we'll t I'll talk about these terms in, in more detail. Common emitter amplifier, what does it mean? Um, how to uh, not design it, but how does it look? What are some key features of this uh, amplifier circuit? And we have to identify the correct option, single option correct. So only three options are wrong. The one option is correct. So, but I was, well, first uh, let's study the options itself because the, that will give us an idea that that will give us a better understanding of this common amplifier circuit, common emitter amplifier circuit. So first option A talks about the output is taken from the emitter. So this means usually in any amplifier, this is an amplifier, there is an input side and there is an output side. On BJT we have three terminals. Okay, this is usually collector, emitter, and base. So, so which one is the input, which one is the output? That's the question over here. That's the first option that is asking. Second is asking, there is a 180 degree phase shift between input and output voltages. So what this amplifier does is, is amplifies some voltage, right? We, we'll see in a while. So let's say the input voltage is like, let's say small, and the output voltage would be big, the swing would be big, right? Let's say this is one millivolts. Maybe this will uh, increase it to one volts. The, this values, it may increase, but there may be a phase shift. So there may be phase shift by 90 degrees, zero degree, or 180 degrees. What is it? Is there any phase shift? And if it's a phase shift, is it 180 degree or zero degrees? So that's the option B and C. And uh, the fourth option is PN junction is forward bias. You know that in, in, in common base emitter, so this is an NPN. So this is N, collector is N, base is P, emitter is again N. So it's, it asks which one of these junctions is forward bias, which one is reverse bias. Again, we'll see uh, in a bit, but these are some very, uh, not just common emitter amplifier, for any circuit of BJT, at least the, the, the first point and fourth point are very important. Fourth point, in fact, is the most important. That will determine that how a BJT is, how that specific BJT is behaving. Based, it, it, be, it depends critically on the biasing of the, of the collector base junction or base emitter and, and other junctions. So we'll see that in a minute. Right. So let's first quickly see what a transistor does. So bipolar junction transistor is made up of three words. Third word, which is talk about first, transistor. A transistor is a device where third terminal is controlling the flow between the other two terminals. So as you can see that, you can see that on the left, there's some water. This blue is the water level and this is a tube. On the right side, there's again a tube of the same diameter. So uh, there's nothing connected in between. However, if I if I were to connect using a straight rod, right, the water will start to flow from left to right, right. But but now I'm creating a, a this weird uh, like a zigzag shaped rod. So what's going to happen is that since the water level is just above the the level over here, some water will start to flow, and you can collect some of. This. So this is you can say this is the supply side. This is the um, uh, this is where we are collecting the water, this is from where we are supplying the water. So you can see some amount of water can flow. 
Now what, so now the question is, is there any way that we can lower this barrier or increase this barrier? Let's say if we are lowering this barrier, you can clearly see that on the left side, the water level remains the same. However, now more amount of water can flow, right? If, we, if I lower this barrier, the ba this is the middle part is the barrier, the left part is the supply, and the right part is where we collect the water. However, if I were to artificially raise the barrier, this is the same, the pipe dimensions, the water level exactly remains the same. How, if I raise the barrier, you can see this, this middle part, now it's, it's, it's above the water level, so clearly no water can flow. So what's happening is that just by changing the height of the middle barrier, I'm able to control that how much water is flowing or if the water is flowing, even flowing or not. That's what a transistor does. So transistor, by controlling the middle level, it can control the flow of electrons from one, from one terminal to the other. Why it's the, the, the junction word here denotes that we are talking about the PN junctions over here. We'll see that in the next slide. And bipolar means the current is due to both electrons as well as bipolar. Bi means two, polar means poles. So there one pole is electron, the other is holes. So the elect current is due to both electrons as well as holes. Right. So based on how you arrange your PN junctions, you can be it, 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 either it can be NPN BJT or PNP BJT. If it's an NPN BJT, an electron is the majority charge carrier. However, uh, uh, and hole is the minority charge carrier. Uh, on the other case, in PNP BJTs, hole is the majority charge carrier, electron is the minority charge carrier. We'll restrict ourselves to the discussion on NPN BJT. That's the more commonly used one, right? So hey, these are the schematics. So you can see this is the symbol of uh, NPN BJT. So clearly you can see the difference. That arrow is pointing outwards in emitter. This denotes it's NPN. In PNP, the arrow points inwards from emitter to base. This is a PNP, and you can see it's N plus PNN. So this emitter is N, base is P, collector is N, and the opposite side over here. You can see the corresponding currents. And this is an important thing that with uh, this uh, questions can be asked regarding this. Usually emitter is high doped, base is very low doped, collector is moderately doped. And the emitter is moderate width, collector is wide because it needs to collect all the electrons. Base is narrow because we don't want to lose any electrons that are traversing the NPN junction because electrons has to travel from this direction to this direction. Right. Uh, now that we have seen some basics of a, of, a, of a BJT, one of its primary application is this common emitter amplifier. So you can see that what, what do we mean by common emitter? Common emitter. Uh, I am emitting common emitter means emitter has to be common or in other words you can say you can ground the emitter and you apply the input on the base side so base emitter junction you apply the input you can see there's an input this is the by this is the DC input VBB and there is an AC input you can see over here uh, this, this is the symbol for AC signal similarly the other junction is collector emitter junction because emitter is common to both the inputs I told you an amplifier looks something like this right this is the input side and this is the output side this is the output side and this is the input side so on the input side we have emitter and base so from here we are providing input and we're measuring the output on collector and emitter right so emitter is the common to both the input is being applied to the base and the output is being measured you can see this is the output voltage the output is being measured from somewhere over here emitter remains the reference again you have a you have a collector biasing and obviously we are measuring this small thing the ACC V out signal over here so you can see it's amplifier because you apply a small input signal IB but to get a large output IC because you know that beta equal to IC upon IB beta is the current gain so based on that you can get a even though you apply a very small signal let's say 1 millivolts you can get maybe if beta is 100 you can get a 100 millivolts 100 sorry milliamps signal for the collector current now what I'll try to do is I'll try to break it into two parts, the DC part and the AC part. So for, let's first discuss the DC part because it's only this analysis which will determine whether it's even whether it will even behave as an amplifier or not. So, so you can see on your screens that this is the output waveform. So this is also known as the output waveform of a BJT. On the y-axis you have the collector current IC. On the x-axis you have the collector emitter voltage we saw in the last slide that's where we are measuring the output you can see that right so uh, the, the first the first of all you can clearly see that this orangish region called the cutoff region in this base emitter is reverse biased 
and base collector is reverse bias means emitter cannot uh, the base uh, the emitter cannot provide any electrons uh, so so there is no point of any current being uh, available at the collector so just just to make it more clear so what's happening is that so this is emitter this is base and this is electrons have to travel from this side to this side right so if this is if this is not forward bias the electrons cannot even uh, transit this region so this has so at least so in the that's why this you see cut off this very low current however when the when the base emitter is forward bias you can see in these two cases so when base emitter is forward bias and if we reverse bias the base collector junction so what is going to happen is that there will be a depletion region uh, these are some in-depth things which you can refer to some nptl videos on that so what's going to happen is that electrons are going to be swept away due to the large electric field so this is the most common the the, the middle the between the b and c this the central region that you see this is where we usually operate an amplifier and in this the base collector is reverse bias pardon the base so this is the condition that we we interested in base emitter is forward bias because you want to supply as many electrons as possible base collector is reverse bias because you want to collect as many electrons at the collector junction as possible so this is the configuration in which we operate in so one is forward bias the other is reverse bias and this is the region the central region that you see over here this is the active region on the left you have the saturation region where the base emitter is forward bias and base collector is also forward bias this is usually uh, used for switching applications not amplifier applications bc this central region is where we use for amplifier applications right so uh, so this is a typical this is, this is the diagram again in the last slide so i have just clipped it uh, a certain part of it so what i want you to say what i want to do is i want to apply k k v l over here follow this line okay i'm going to write kvl along this loop so i can write v plus minus let's assume ic current is flowing over in this minus ic rc minus vce equal to zero this is this potential is nothing but vce now vce is nothing but our x axis you can see over here so i write is at x v plus is a constant minus ic is my y y rc equal to zero i'll rearrange the terms we can get y equal to one by rc times x plus um sorry it's going to be minus plus v plus by rc so y equal to mx plus c you can see uh, that form over here excuse me yeah we will get to the answer in a minute but i want to just explain the concept of bjt uh, yeah so y equal to minus 1 by rc into x plus so you can see y equal to mx plus c the slope is negative right so what i'll do is that i can draw this line right i can draw this line and i can i can just obtain all the so you can uh, obtain the intercepts by putting the value y equal to 0 this v plus is nothing but vcc so this v plus is also referred to as vcc sometimes so this is what is called a load line right so v out is going to be determined by the intersection of this load line and the region over here right so let's say i am interested in this point the intersection over here so what i'll do is that i'll apply my bias my my we, we saw in the last like vbb and vcc accordingly that our drain current comes out to be this much and our base current sorry the collector current and base current the base current will be ib2 and correspondingly the collector current will be beta times ib2 so biasing is important we want to bias it near the center not near the edge because we want a we want the swing the output swing right now come to the issue once we have biased the circuit now we want to analyze how does this circuit behave when we apply a small signal or this is sometimes called the ac signal right so this is this is a, a, a corresponding uh, a model of a sm ac small signal for this np and bjt it's like that and this was a circuit that we saw two slides back but i'll simply do is that i'll 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 replace the bjt with this model secondly I'll remove all the in I'll short all the independent voltage sources. So you can see I've replaced this this BJT with this circuit over here and I've shorted all the independent voltage sources. If there are current sources, we will open them. Now what I'll do is that I'll simply now analyze this. So uh, we can simply assume it to be grounded. I told you this is the reference, right? 
and now we I'm interested in finding the voltage gain so gain is equal to what this is going to be V out over V in so I'm interested in finding what is this value right so we know that V out we are taking from here and this is the V in right so if you see, if you see if I apply Ohm's law across this resistor so Ohm's law across R pi what will I get I'll get V that is V in minus 0 you see one end is V in the other is 0 I'll get V in minus 0 equal to current current that is IB times R that is R pi so I'll get V in equal to IB times R pi now uh, similarly what I'll do I'll apply Ohm's law across this RC resistor so Ohm's law across RC sometimes this is also known as the load resistor so this is these are interchangeably used so that's why so this is going to be so IC is flowing over here so this current would again be IC so I can write the voltage across this would be V out minus 0 this is equal to minus IC times RC so this will give me V out equal to minus IC RC now V out by V in gain V out by V in V out is this minus IC RC and V in is IB RB and I know this is a BJT operating in, in the active region so, so IC would be beta IB so I can write as minus beta RC upon sorry this is R pi upon R pi so I get gain equal to minus beta RC upon R pi what does this mean uh, beta is a positive quantity rc is a positive quantity r pi is a negative quantity this means v out is this minus sign denotes that v out and v in are 180 degrees out of phase if the sign were positive here that means they were completely in phase 180 degrees means you are completely opposite diametrically opposite hence uh, V out and V in are out of phase now we'll come back to our problem so we saw that output is taken from emitter no we saw that input was base output was collector so first option is wrong second option says uh, there is a 180 degree phase shift between input and output voltage that is correct we saw we, uh, we derived the uh, expression for gain so we saw that it's coming out to minus beta rc upon r pi something like that gain so input and output voltages were 180 degree out of phase so, so this is correct this is not correct both p-n junctions are forward bias no we saw that base emitter was forward and collector emitter sorry collector base was reverse and this mode is also known as the forward active mode forward active region of a B J T so this is what we have talked so D is also wrong so only option B is correct note that this is a common emitter amplifier circuit there are other configurations like common base or common collector so the analysis will change in that but the way I have discussed it like you first know the some basic understanding of BJT and then you try to find the biasing the DC biasing and accordingly then you solve the uh, you draw the AC equivalent to find the expression for gain so these are the steps if you follow the question can just be about the gain itself that find the gain so that will be a subset of this question so I just wanted to give a complete picture because it's a good question that this touches upon all the concepts of a of an amplifier based on BJT similarly there are amplifiers based on FET field effect transistors like MOSFETs so the, the analysis remains the same it, it very few things change um, so that completes this question but again I'll pause for a bit and if you have any any part that you want me to explain um, again uh, please ask I'll wait for a bit <coughs> this question clear sir sorry this clear sir okay uh, Mandlik you okay you are there yes sir okay okay uh, so if you're good with that uh, now I'll move to the next question this question um, okay uh, how should I say this this is a question from 2011 a similar question 
just they change they change just this voltage the same question was repeated i think 6 or 7 years later so that's why previous year questions are important so you must solve all the previous year questions the gate exam is 10 days away try to solve all the previous year questions if you've not already done so not just for gate for net and for just also because usually the questions the statements just change the some some numerical values or some very just a couple of words and if you if you have solved those questions in your room it's high chances that you can do it in the exam itself all right coming back to this question now question says in the following circuit tr1 and tr2 are identical transistors we'll see what do we mean by identical having vbe equal to 0.7 volts so we are given that their base emitter is 0.7 this means base emitter is forward bias note that these are npn so b, if, if this is positive this means this is forward so b base is p emitter is is n so p is at a higher potential as compared to n this means this is a forward bias so b is forward bias and the current passing through transistor 2 is so we need to find this current mm, let's call this ic2 maybe okay so we need to find the value for this okay now whenever a whenever a question for bjt comes now you have to be make you have to make sure in which region are they operating in just just a, a few minutes ago we talked about the four regions right uh, these are the four regions that we had talked about so i told you when in this region the the between b and c this is this is this this, is this region and base emitter is forward in question it's given the base emitter is forward bias right and this is also where you saw the amplifier but the base character here is reverse biased right so we need to identify first of all whether our transistor is operating in which of these modes which of these regions okay so we know that base emitter is forward bias it's been given to us so it's it's one of these two right but is it what what about the base collector is it reverse bias or is it forward bias let's try to identify that quickly so we know that so we know let's assume this to be zero volts this is the first transistor let's first talk about the first transistor itself this is zero volts and we are given this is 0.7 volts right vbe was 0.7 this is a short this will also be 0.7 volts i'm drawing this from here you can see that this this is the configuration for transistor one this is transistor two so i just copied them over here so so vc will also be at 0.7 volts and ve is zero so this means vce vce is 0.7 volts for transistor 1 vce1 is 0.7 volts and we know that um, yeah uh, so we, and we need to identify between the base collector biasing so base collector biasing you can see these are shorted right they're neither reverse not forward for this transistor this means you are exactly at this point b this is also by the way known as knee because you can see that this is shaped like a knee this curve so this is neither neither in active nor in saturation transistor one but for the sake of simplicity we can assume it to be in the active region because it's at the junction of it we can assume it to be anywhere for the sake of simplicity we, we assume it to be in the active region over here let's talk about transistor two so transistor two again this is zero and we are given its 0.7 volts vb is 0.7 but we don't know what this voltage is if we go back you can see that this point is connected to plus 5 volts right so this is plus 5 volts so i can see that vcb2 vcb2 this thing this is going to be 5 minus 0 0.7 this is 4.3 volts now this is n this is p you can see that the n terminal the collector terminal which is n type is at a higher potential as compared to the p terminal the base this means this is reverse bias n is at a higher potential as compared to p so this means transistor 2 is over here base collector is reverse bias this means we can clearly say that transistor 2 is operating somewhere over here right in this region between b and c this whole region so we know that now so i'll so i'll write it over here so we know that that transistor 2 is in forward active we have determined that just now in the last slide this was at the junction of forward active and saturation but we can assume it to be forward active without i mean we are not losing any information by saying otherwise right and this is the this is our typical uh, npn transistor work so you apply some bias this is a forward active by the way you can clearly see that the that collector base is reverse bias collector is at higher potential base is at lower similarly base emitter is forward bias base is at higher 
and the emitter is at lower and these are the doping so, so some electrons will flow some of a very small amount will get recombined over here but most of them will reach the collector and that's how the current will flow right and these are the expression that we saw kcl will give you ie equal to ic plus ib beta is the current gain ic upon ib alpha is your efficiency which is given by the collector current i mean the current which is reaching the output versus the current at the emitter so so usually this will always be less than one for good for good uh, devices or uh, for for decent biasing this will be very close to one maybe 0 0.999 0 0.995 something like that and beta typically is 100 200 something like that and this is just a kcl okay so now we we are equipped with some mathematical expressions and now we can attempt to solve this one so this is the circuit that was given to us and um, now what i have done is i have labeled some voltages so i have assumed emitter to be the ground and i have you can see in blue this is vb1 the base voltage for the first transistor similarly base voltage for second transistor vb2 and this is vc1 the collector voltage the collector uh, voltage for first transistor okay and these are the currents that are flowing so ic2 is the one that we need to determine and i is the current flowing through this 100 ohm resistor and ib2 is the current that will be flowing through the base of transistor 2 similarly iv1 will be the current that will be flowing through the base of transistor 1 it will come like this and ic1 is through the collector current of transistor 1 okay and vbe is given at 0 .7, 0 0.7 volts beg your pardon and ic2 is the one that we need to determine now uh, how do we go ahead uh, and uh, by solving it so what i'll try to do is that you can see on this junction what i'll do is i'll apply kcl at node vc1 at this node what i'll write is i'll write all the incoming current so incoming i'll write this incoming current equal to outgoing current so incoming current is nothing but capital i outgoing current is ib1 plus ic1 plus ib2 you can see these three currents right okay now remember the question said these transistors are identical what that mean if that if their b if their base emitter voltage is same their ib will also be the same ib1 will be equal to ie2 because vbe1 equal to vbe2 also beta1 will be equal to beta2 because again because they are identical okay so what i'll what i'll do is that i'll simply write this as ib and if um right uh, yeah so beta1 equal to beta2 so i can write this now as beta ib plus this will also be ib so i will be equal to beta plus 2 ib okay this is the value of current i that i have obtained now if i apply ohm's law across this resistor the 100 ohm resistor i can write so i'll write this over here ohm's law across 100 ohm i'll write v that is 5 volts minus vc1 equal to i times 100 ohms so what i'll get is 5 minus now what's the value of vc1 node this is 0 and we were given vb equal to 0 0.7 so this node is at 0 0.7 volts right and this is the same node as this so vc1 will also be 0 0.7 equal to i times 100 this will give me i equal to uh, 4.3 over 100 this will be 1043 milliamps so i get i equal to 43 milliamps right so if i put this over here i can get beta plus 2 ib equal to 43 milliamps this is the expression that we have obtained now i'll come to this we were required to find ic2 ic2 is nothing but beta ib2 which is nothing but beta ib right if beta is large that means beta is greater greater than 1 let's say so beta plus 2 i can approximate as beta if beta is 100 so we can neglect 2 that's the whole point so beta plus 2 is approximately equal to beta just a second 
all right beta plus 2 will be, will be approximately equal to beta so 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 we can say that that beta ib this implies beta ib will be nothing but 43 milliamps and this is nothing but the value of we can put this beta ib over here this is nothing but 43 milliamps so this is ic2 so ic2 will come out to be 43 milliamps coincidentally ic1 will also come out to be 43 milliamps if we assume beta is greater than 1 you can see that the current flowing through this transistor first transistor is exactly the same as second transistor this type of circuit is also called as a current mirror in the first uh, question that we talked about the capacitor one it was talking about a constant current source that's how a, a constant current source is usually produced so this transistor will always have 43 milliamps and this will force that current through this transistor to be again 43 milliamps and you can put one more transistor that will also be 43 milliamps so that's how a constant current source is usually produced and note that whatever the whatever the how this 43 milliamps came it depended only on this power supply and on this resistor right and all these transistors were um, were uh, identical that was given so that's a, that's that's a, that's why I was telling that there has there is a usually a power supply which drives all these circuits, and and you, and that will set some saturation point. So capacitor cannot keep on getting charged indefinitely. So that's what I was talking about over there. But yeah, for this problem we saw that the current through these two transistors will be the same because this is a mirroring circuit, also known as, uh, usually called the current mirror, and the current usually depends only on the the input uh, the input uh, the, the voltage supply and the, the biasing resistor which is called usually over here. So what we had obtained was that IC2 was 43 milliamps which is option D that we can see over there. Right. So yeah uh, that's it uh, for this problem. Uh, I'll again pause for a bit. If there are any doubts you can or any clarifications that you have please feel free to ask. This is a question I have. Can you please show that? Uh, which which part, Pandlik? The solution. Okay, this was the solution. You want me to repeat something? Uh, I can do that. So beta here we have assumed, right? Beta, yes. Beta, since it was not given in the problem. So you can see that uh, over here, so I was, we obtained 43 milliamps and this was equal to beta plus 2 IB over here. I cannot get the value of IB unless I know beta, right? But if I assume beta to be very large, let's say 100, 200, what I can do is that I can drop the 2 over here and I can simply say beta IB is nothing but 43 milliamps. Essentially, I'm ignoring, I'm saying that base current is, I can neglect base current as compared to the collector current. Which is, which is a, a safe assumption, yeah. So that's what I'm doing. But uh, usually they, sh they they provide, if not, you, you can assume beta to be greater than 1. That's the point. Uh, sir, can you convert this thing in the circuit diagram which you showed for open? Sorry, sorry? Sir, the uh, circuit diagram which you showed for open. Uh -huh. Can you convert this circuit into that? That this circuit cannot be converted because see this is this is uh, this circuit is what is a current mirror circuit. So these are two different. They both use BJDs. Yes, that's true. But uh, so in in that circuit, uh, if you remember, uh, I'll draw. I'll write over here. Okay. So in that circuit, if you remember, it was something like this. So this was VCC. These were the two resistors and then we had these two BJTs, right? And then there was a emitter resistor. So this was RE and the, the inputs were being, what? sorry, this is over here. Two different inputs were being provided. This was what we called V in plus. This is what we called V in minus. If you compare to this circuit, here the inputs are the same. The emitter is same. The emitter, the both the emitters were shorted here also, just like this. But the base, what here the bases are at same potential. You can see the base for this transistor and the base for this transistor are this are shorted. It's not the case here. Here they, they are usually different, denoted by V in plus and V in minus over there. So it cannot be converted. It uses two BJTs, yes. 
they are they are they are uh, the power supply to their collectors is the same just like over here it's plus 5 volts the emitters are shorted just like here but the base voltages are different here the bases are also shorted in current mirror while for an operational amplifier or let's say in differential amplifier uh, topography there the the input signals are different they're not the same if they are the same that would mean that uh, that could mean we are in common mode yeah so so common mode will look remarkably similar to this circuit but uh, then see some resistances will i mean play a play their role yes but it functionality would be very close to a current mirror that much i can say not idea not exactly close but uh, you can f uh, follow the same process flow as we followed in the in case of a current mirror does that answer your question yes okay it's not the same uh, it's it's it looks like though because if you flip transistor 2 for current mirror it looks like this but the bases are at a different potential and hence their functionality is also different and that, that that's a good point you raised though okay uh, any other comments or questions regarding this clear sir okay uh, now if you have any specific doubts on bjt or electronics in particular you can ask me because now i'm going to switch to mathematical physics i have a couple of questions from the residual uh, the residue theorem that is there because that's one of the favorite questions that is asked uh, every couple of years maybe that they give a complex uh, you have to integrate a, um, a complex function over a closed loop and you are required to find the integral and using the Cauchy residue theorem. So, I'll, so I'm going to switch to mathematical physics. So hence I'm pausing here for a bit uh, just for your comments that uh, if you have any uh, regarding um, um, electronics in general. So I'll pause and any any questions that you may have, your doubts you may have. Or from... Sir, yeah? uh, t, t flip flop and d flip flop. Okay. Okay. That that part can you please explain? Yeah, I'll do that. Just hold on a second. I'll I'll need to add. Uh, just give me a minute. I'll try to add some space for myself. All right. Is the screen still visible? Yes, sir. Okay. So you were asking about D flip-flop and T flip-flop, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So flip-flops uh, in general, they are used to, uh, how should I say this? They store some value. Okay. So usually uh, in binary, they can store a value 0 or a value 1. But that's not useful. You want, you also want to change it depending on your need. Like for instance, when you when in the night you switch on the uh, the the light bulb in your room or in your house, right? In the daytime, it's not required. Similarly, in in summers, uh, we switch on the fans or ACs or coolers. In winters, usually it's not required. So so that functionality is important. That not just it stores it, but it also can update it. So for instance, if zero, you may want to update it to one. If it's one, you may want to update it to zero and it should store that value continuously until you want to update that. So that's the functionality that flip-flops provide. Now there are different flavors of flip-flops. So you asked uh, one of the, the two, the most common ones. Uh, one is the D flip-flop. Uh, so we'll talk about this. this is the most common type of flip-flop. Okay. So here is the, is a, schematic of a d flip-flop so what it does is that so it has one input usually call it d and it has the output over here which i'm calling it q uh, this is not the complete picture actually so often you will see that there is another output called q bar now this is nothing but invert of whatever q is there so so just you need not bother about this okay for now we'll just assume that it's only D and Q. I want to keep things simple, but you can obtain Q bar just by simply inverting the Q signal. This is the input side. Left side is input, right side is output. Uh, the, I, I am saying it's the incomplete picture because usually there is one more and arguably the most, the, the, 
the critical part of any com uh, of any sequential circuit is the clock so here you can see this is the clock this is the clock so you will provide so every system will run on a clock every computer or system will run on a clock usually it's a square pulse something like this uh, you can uh, uh, so you can see I draw draw it like a rectangular so this denotes it's an edge triggered circuit I will not go into this but just as but just understand there's a clock that is being supplied to this flip-flop Now what this flip-flop does is in, is interesting so I'll, I'll write what is called a truth table so what is a truth table truth table is list of all possible inputs and corresponding outputs of a circuit note all this means you have to list every possible combination so what I'll do I'll draw this double vertical line and I'll write all the possible input combinations that are there so there are two inputs I can see one is D um, what I'll do is that um, I'll write clock on this side clock and D so I can write clock as 0 D as 0 clock as 0 D as 1 clock as 1 d as 0 and clock as 1 and d as 1 so th no other output no other combination is possible apart from this and here is the output which i denote by q so when the clock is low right the output will be retained this means so we call it usually q n plus 1 this means what's going to happen at the next clock edge I'll draw a waveform also, but just for uh, just for the sake of understanding, let's assume this is the Q and plus one. So, so what's going to happen? Whatever the value of D is, when the clock is zero, when the clock is low, so D flip flop will be switched off. It will not do anything. So the the next value of Q will be nothing but the previous value, which is denoted by Q n. Again, the clock is off here. D flip flop it says turn on but no the clock is off D flip flop cannot do anything it will just retain the previous value which you denote by QN right what will happen here when the clock is on this means the D flip flop can now work so if the input is 0 the output will also be 0 right since the clock is on here if the input is 1 the output is 1 do you know what D stands for can you tell me what does this word D stands for D stands for delay what's happening is that whatever the input is you see when the clock is you now what typically what people what what is what we consider is we do not we, just, we do not even consider this part because when the clock is off we know D flip flop is not going to do anything it's going to just store the values so we usually you see you only see bottom two rows in the truth table of D flip flop so uh, again I, I'll also just uh, consider only these two for the time being so when the deep when the input is zero the output will be zero however it will be a delay of one clock what I'll do is now I'll draw the the um, the next slide I'll draw how the output waveform will look like for a deep flip flop so this is my clock this is my input D okay right what I want to I want to know how will Q look like okay so what I'll and Q I'm assuming it's it's only happening at whatever whatever changes will happen will only happen at this edge when clock is rising there are many flavors of uh, by the way a D flip flop so it can be rising edge falling edge many other things but I'm just uh, telling you a very simplistic picture so I'll the only thing of interest is what's happening only at this clock edge so if there are any other changes I'll ignore that so when the clock edge is high sorry when, when there's nothing happening 
there's nothing happening over here i'll assume that the that the initial q n plus q was zero initial value was zero so what's going to happen at this clock edge now now d flip flop can respond because clock allows it to so we'll see that the d is zero so what will happen is that output will change to zero this means it was zero now it will again remain zero it will remain zero until the next clock edge so this will remain zero until here again this clock now says that d flip flop can pass this input so you can see now if d is high q will become high q now will become one again when the next edge comes it will again read the value of d d is high so q will continue till here and q will continue again high because d is high at this junction okay so this value will be passed on to q this will again remain high now, again at this clock edge it will see that the d the value of d is zero so this value of d will be passed to q this will remain high till here this will become zero what's happening is that y is called a delay flip flop or d flip flop because the value of d is passed on to the out the value of this is the input by the way this is the input this is the output the value of input is passed to the output with a certain delay you can see it it uh, the d became high over here but the value got passed only at a, after a certain delay right hence it is called a delay flip flop similarly you can see Although the values changed over here, you can see it became zero and then it became, but that got lost because it because it happened very fast. So the clock also plays a role. So D flip flop, uh, the input should not change very frequently if you want to store every value. But the whole point here is that what I want to emphasize is that based on this truth table, the bottom two rows especially, when the clock allows, the output will be exactly the same what the input is at that point. So you can see if the input was zero over here. The output was also zero. If the input was one at this clock edge, the output was one. If the input was one at this clock edge, the output was one. If the input was zero at this clock edge, the output was zero. And that's how a delay flip flop or D flip flop operates. Is it uh, clear, sir? Okay. Uh, second one was which one? I forgot. T flip flop. T flip flop. Do you know what T stands for? Apanna? No, sir. T stands for toggle. Do you know what toggle means? Changes the value zero to one. Like that. Yeah, toggle means it can be from zero to one. This is also a toggle zero to one, and from or from one to zero. This means a toggle flip flop will change the value of output. If the output was zero initially, it will change it. To, uh, if the output was zero initially, it will change it to one. And vice versa. If the output was one initially, it will change to zero. That's the functionality of a toggle flip flop. How does it look like, though? So this is a. So again, this looks something like this. Um, just hold on a second. Uh, T flip flop. This is the input side. Again, this is the output side. Uh, I'm not drawing the Q bar, which is again present. You can always get Q bar just by inverting the Q. So I'm not drawing here. And also there is a clock over here. Okay, there's a clock that's coming to this T flip flop. A rectangular clock, uh, square pulse that I'm assuming over here. What I'll do again, I'll write the truth table. As you know, truth table is a combination of all possible inputs. So what I'll do is that this is T, oh sorry, this is clock first of all, and then there is T, and the output would be Q, okay. So again, when the clock is uh, zero, and toggle can be zero or one, and the clock is high, again the toggle can be zero or one. So I told you when the clock is low, so this is the next output, so it will retain the output because clock is slow so no action will happen even though you can even though you are you are trying to tell this flip flop to change the values it will not do because clock is not there however when the clock is high if if toggle is zero this means it will not toggle clock is saying you can toggle but toggle input is saying no not yet please wait so so the, so the future the next output will be the same as the sorry the the future output will be the same as the previous output however if the toggle is high if t is one and clock is also one then it will toggle and denote toggle by q and bar 
So the next output will be inversion of whatever the previous output was. Again, I'll try, I, I'll try to explain this using a waveform for better understanding what I mean. So this is my clock. Again, I'm taking only rising edge. So you can, this is for the sake of simplicity. I don't want to confuse too much, right? And the next thing is toggle flip-flop, which we denote the input by T. So what I'm going to do is, um, yeah, let's draw some random. Yeah, so let's do this, okay? So this is the output Q, right? And we are interested only at the, only at these edges because that's where the action will happen. The clock only will allow the output to change only at these, the dotted lines, the, only at these time intervals. So again, I'll assume that the initially, initially the output was zero. Initially the output was zero. Usually this is provided in the problem itself, right? So here the clock is allowing, but toggle is zero. So no toggle will happen. This means toggle input is zero. So not, so if the initial input was zero, so the final output will also continue to be zero, right? What happens in next event? So when this happens, the clock is saying you can change. And we'll see that toggle input is high. This means whatever the input is, so initial input was zero. Now in now final output was will become one. Sorry, and since toggle input is high, clock is allowing the toggle input to to, uh, to dictate the output, so, initial, so, so the output will toggle from 0 to 1 and it will continue to be 1 until the next event. So next event will happen at this time interval denoted by the dashed line. So the clock is allowing, now again the toggle input is high, this means if the toggle input is high, the output will toggle again. You can see if t is 1 and clock is 1, qn is q, next q will be qn bar. So, q, so 1 bar is 0. This means it will toggle again, it will go to zero. It will continue to be zero until this point. Again, the clock is saying toggle input, toggle can toggle input can change the output. But since toggle input is zero, output will not change. Output will remain zero because you see when t equal to zero, clock equal to one, the next output, the next output is same as the previous output. So zero will remain zero. Finally, over here, what's going to happen is Clock is saying you can, clock is saying that the output can change and toggle input is high. So again, this will toggle, it will again toggle from 0 to 1, 0 to 1. So that's how a toggle uh, flip-flop behaves. Okay, this, this is, this is, uh, this is the truth table. Again, uh, as I told earlier that usually, usually what you see is only the bottom two rows. Only these two rows you see. These two rows are usually not talked about because clock is low, so no change can happen. So this is only the, Change is what we, we want to capture. So changes are happening only at this junction. Okay, so that yes, is sir. okay. So that is the complete picture. Uh, but, sir. Uh -huh. but sir, just, just, uh, just one more thing. Just one more. The T flip flop is nothing but a, a version of J K flip flop. Okay. Uh, uh, bottom two rows are taken. Uh, then uh -huh. first two rows are not uh, taken now. Usually, because you see the the output is not changing, right? If the clock is not there, the output is not, even though you toggle, even though you change the toggle input, if the clock is not there, the output will not change. It will retain whatever the value is. Usually that's not, that's not in truth table. Ideally, this is, this should be included, but for the sake of simplicity, so as to not to complicate uh, the, uh, so as to, for better understanding, these are usually omitted, but it's not like they're not there. They're there. Functionality wise, they are there. For understanding, for, for teaching purposes, usually sometimes they're not, uh, written. That's what I meant to say. But they are happening. Okay, yeah. sir. Clear. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that was that. Uh, JK flip flop. You can uh, forgetting how to get a T flip flop from a JK flip flop. I think you just uh, short the um, the two inputs. I think, uh, and then you get a T flip flop, a toggle flip flop by the shorting the uh, two. I think. Yeah, so if you short J and K, so you can get toggle flip-flop from J and K. I think it's something like this. So this is JK flip-flop has two inputs, J and K. 
right and then again q and then there's again a q bar which i'm not drawing obviously there is a clock which is like this and if you short j and k if i'm not wrong that is then is this equivalent to nothing but a you call this t and this is nothing but a t flip flop this is the clock this is the q so this is the same equivalent circuit like this i'll just confirm just hold on a minute i'll just Mm, confirm whether this is correct or not because I don't want to yeah I think this is correct yeah if... okay yeah sure. hmm. all right so that's about flip flops any other any other uh, doubts you have clear, uh, clear sir okay all right uh, so if nothing in electronics then I'll move on to the mathematical physics portion i have a couple of questions in that so 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 th th this is the question that i was in 2012 then i and i have one more question from 2014 these keep on repeating so I, that's why i'm emphasizing the value of the question is the value of integral uh, c is the contour which is given like this for circle with unit is at equal to one and this is the expression that we want to integrate and this is a multiple choice question with one correct answer and we'll and we'll try to find out the correct option okay so this is the problem this is the integral that is given to us and we need to find its value right and over over this contour c is this contour that you can see uh, mod z equal to one this is the complex plane i have drawn x axis and y axis y is imaginary obviously um so so the the way we try to find is that so uh, so there's uh, there's something called the residue theorem residue theorem it says that the integral of a function over a over any closed loop is equal to 2 pi i sigma residues so we, we we try to find something called a residue why sigma because there, there may be many points so, so z equal to z i so residues at z i so we try to find the residues at these specific points called z i's how do how do we determine which are the z i's so z i's are usually what are referred to as the poles where this note that e raised to the power 1 by z is usually a well-behaving function so exponential functions are well-behaving except only at z equal to 0 you see if you put z equal to 0 this will blow up e raised to the infinity this, this will no more be an analytic function so what we need to we, we try to find out the residues at the poles so if you try to if you see if you consider this as to be the fz I'll try to find out the poles for this. So I can write e to the power x can be exp ex expanded as 1 over uh, fx um, plus I think x square by 2 factorial. So 1 by z square by 2 factorial. And so on the, and you will see the, uh, the following, the other terms, the higher order terms. So you can clearly see that it will be like 1 over 1 plus z plus 1 over 2z square and so on and so forth so z equal to 0 you can clearly see is a pole over here right <clears throat> so how do we find the residue there are many ways of finding the residue by the way for for such a problem the one of the most common way uh, to find out is that is to write the expansion of the function is write the expansion of the function and try to find the coefficient of 1 over z so here the pole is z equal to 0 so i'll write that so so first step is identify the poles they can be multiple poles by the way so identify the poles second step is write the expansion of the function right and third step is expansion of function around pole this is important around the pole so here the pole was at z equal to 0 and we write the expansion around z equal to 0 and we find the coefficient of 1 over z minus z naught so here z naught is the pole so z naught equal to 0 so 
we so so we find to write the coefficient one one over z minus z naught. So in in our case, now I'll write this over here. So in our case, z naught is zero because that's our pole, right? So if you write the expansion around the pole, it will be one over one over z plus uh, something over uh, z square. I forgot the coefficient and then higher order terms. So we found now we wrote the expansion. Now finally we try to find the coefficient. Of one over z minus z naught term, so one over one minus so coefficient of one over z minus z naught, one over z minus zero. So coefficient of one minus one over z is nothing but one. So this means the residue at z equal to zero is coming out to be one. And note that there is only one pole. There are this is a higher order pole, but there is only one pole. So the co coefficient is coming out to be one. And we saw that that this integral over the contour. Okay, one more thing: the contour has to include the pole. Only those poles we'll consider. So we find out the pole is here, over here, z equal to zero. So we'll only consider those poles which are inside this contour, right? So so there is only one pole inside the contour, which is z equal to zero. So identify the poles inside the contour. So this is the complete picture. Identify the poles inside the contour. So contour was uh, mod z equal to one. So the z equal to zero falls inside this contour. Z not equal to zero. That's the pole. We we wrote the ex expansion which is like this, and if we found the coefficient of one over z minus z not, so which was one. So residue. This is nothing but the residue. This is one, and this is two pi i, and sigma residue. So there is only one pole. So sigma will just be only one this will come out to be two pi into y and this is the expression this is the sorry uh, the option that is the correct one which be d two pi i this is the expression this is the expression that you that you must remember this is the f that comes from the residue theorem an interesting thing i uh, just uh, is, are there any doubts regarding the problem because i want to build up on this because there are many closely associated concepts with just this theorem there's a very straightforward problems which are asked frequently uh, in gate maybe in net and just also yeah go ahead you raise your hand sir uh, sir in all exponential cases uh -huh. uh, we expand by taylor's theorem huh. yes because we uh, the the reason we do that is because we know already the expansion of uh, the exponential functions even for let's say sinusoidal functions right we know the expansion for uh, uh, the the uh, the taylor expansion for a sinusoid right sin z let's say if it's given in the problem so we we know the expansion for uh, for sinusoid so we can use that because we know okay. because we know that that's why we are using it. If we had not known that, for instance, uh, the the most common ones are uh, exponential, logarithmic, uh, sinusoidal, uh, all the trigonometric ones, the common ones, sine, cos, and tan. So, so we can directly uh, employ them over here. And there are that's why I told you there are other ways. For instance, you can t also take the limits. That's the other. The, that is more helpful in case of uh, let's say polynomial ones where you have uh, let's say one over uh, z square minus uh, uh, 6 or z square minus 3z plus uh, 2 where you have two roots two poles for instance there it's better to to use the limit uh, approach for the, the you can also this is so i told you there are many ways of finding the residue so so the first way i'll write this here so first way uh, how to find the residues first way is the is the taylor uh, expansion uh, the second one which is which is, uh, is also commonly used is the limit you take the limit of uh, limit z goes to z naught z minus z naught into f z this is the residue so in this you use the uh, i'll write it on the next slide maybe yeah i'll write it here so there are two ways to find the residues two common ways there are other ways also so first is the Taylor expansion and then you find the coefficient corresponding coefficient that you need second one is to find the this limit 
limit z goes to z naught um, z minus z naught fz uh, this will give you the residue so there are two ways of doing it so yeah that's the idea that you know, to try to follow here clear yes, sir okay uh, right uh, so now what i'll try to do is using the same uh, this is this again the same question uh, not same question a similar question that was asked a couple of three years later maybe the the concept remains the same uh, we need to find the value of this integral that is given so i equal to this integral and over the contour c where c is a circle given by mod z equal to 4 and we need a uh, single option correct question so we'll try to this is i have just read on uh, rewritten the problem and so this is uh, so this is what we uh, this is what we know for this okay so what's going to happen so what i'm going to do is um, right so we need to find first of all as i told you there, there are the first thing is to you need to identify the poles identify the poles inside the contour so uh, so let's try to do that so you can so so this this is the function that is given to us uh, f z is given as z square over e to the power z plus one now z square does not have any poles it has zeros but it does not have any poles the denominator however e to the power z plus one equal so when e to the power z plus one will go to zero then the whole function will have some poles so i'll write that and e to the power z1 equal to 0 so this will give me the poles so whatever the value of z that we obtain over here will give us some poles so let's try to solve this this will e to the power z equal to minus 1 right so this would mean uh, i can say z equal to so this will be minus 1 when it's cos pi so cos pi would be okay huh so when z is iota times pi but odd odd values okay so it will be like this i'll tell you how i obtained this so z equal to i pi 2k plus 1 so for the sake of simplicity let's just assume k equal to 0 right so there will be many poles not just one pole there will be many many poles so for assume let's say k equal to 0 so first pole i can write as z0 equal to i pi okay so let's try to well find the value of uh, i pi uh, i into pi and let's try to find the expression for the denominator e to the power z plus 1 so i'll write e to the power i pi plus 1 okay so e to the power i pi you can uh, um, so this will be you know e to the power i uh, e to the power i theta is cos theta plus iota sin theta so this will be cos pi plus iota sin pi plus 1 sin pi is 0 cos pi is minus 1 so minus 1 plus 1 come out to be 0 and so you can clearly see so all the uh, when the when the multiple of pi is odd then cos pi will turn minus 1 and then minus 1 and plus 1 will give 0 so that's why i wrote only so k is an integer so where k is an integer where k is integer so only odd multiples of pi so i pi 3 i pi 5 i pi and similarly on the negative side minus i pi minus um, 3 i pi minus 5 i pi only those will will be the poles so so i so i identified the poles these are the poles okay these are the poles that i have identified now but that's not the complete picture we need to identify the poles that are inside the contour so what what i'll do i'll write just uh, some of the very first some of the some of the poles the value of some of the poles so it will be minus iota 5 pi minus iota 3 pi minus iota pi iota pi iota 3 pi iota 5 pi and so on and similarly on the negative side also note that the we need to we are interested only in contour up to z equal to 4 okay so what i'll write to do i'll write to now write their magnitudes correspondingly so this will be minus iota will be nothing this will be nothing but 5 pi this will be 3 pi 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 3 pi and 5 pi pi is approximately 
so this means this value will come out to be maybe sorry this is minus no no this is yeah on the negative side so this may be somewhere on this like these points will be here uh, so this will be 3.14 this will be around uh, 9 point something this will be around 10 uh, so this will be minus iota pi this will be minus 3 iota pi minus 5 iota pi and again this will be iota pi here it will be 3 iota pi so we can clearly see that only two poles there are infinite number of poles by the way for this function for this fz but we are interested only in the poles that are inside the contour okay so we can see that only these only these poles are there that are inside the contour so 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 we are only interested in two poles so i, I can write that as z1 as plus iota pi and let's say z2 as minus iota pi so i'm only interested as to what's happening on these two poles and i'm not interested in happening at at at, at any other pole that is there okay so these are the two poles of interest to us right so this this is the first step and the second step that we try to do is that now uh, what we can try to do is we will now we'll have to expand this function if i want to use the taylor series i want to use the taylor series then i have to expand it first around z equal to i pi then i'll find the coefficient which will give me the residue and for the second part again i expand the taylor series this time around z equal to minus iota pi and this will give me another coefficient that will be the second residue i'll do an and do a algebraic sum of those two residues and then i can multiply 2 pi i to give me the to give me to evaluate this expression uh, note that this is nothing but 2 pi i sigma residues sigma is running over the poles inside this contour right i can do that that would be a tedious exercise however in this case what i'll what i would prefer to do is i'll prefer to use the the limit approach okay so let's try to do that so if i if i use the limit approach so that will be limit set tends to i pi this will be z minus i pi times z square over excuse me yeah i think so yes i think so but you need to uh, you need to just evaluate this um yeah so so if we try to evaluate this um how do i do this so this is a zero by zero form what i can do is i can apply the the l hospital rule yes uh, so um I forget how do we do that um, um just just wait for a minute i'll try to think of the how to apply that rule um Hmm. Uh, so let's just try to put it so this will be zero and this will also be zero so z square is the term which i can simply pull out z square i can pull out this is limit z tends to uh, i pi uh, z minus i pi over e to the power z plus one yeah so 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 i can differentiate the two terms over here that are here so this will give me one over e to the power z right and this is uh, z square that will remain i'll put z value as i pi so this will be i pi whole square times e to the power i pi i just differentiated the numerator and denominator using the loss l hospital rule this will come out to be minus pi square um, and this will come out to be um, e to the power i pi we just calculated it there i think it was yeah minus one cos pi that's minus one so this is coming out to be pi square 
now we'll uh, evaluate the second limit that is z goes to minus i pi the expression will be z plus i pi into z square over e to the power z plus 1 so again you can just take uh, z square out again limit z tends to minus i pi so this is z plus i pi over e to the power z plus 1 again this is e to z square so differentiate this will become 1 no, denominator will be e to the power z so this will again become minus i pi whole square over 1 over e to the power minus i pi this will again minus minus this will again minus pi square uh, uh, this will again be minus 1 so this will also come out to be pi square right and we know that that integral this integral will be 2 pi i sum of residues so we have calculated the residues over here so this is 2 pi i first residue is pi square second residue is also pi square 2 pi i into 2 pi square which will come out to be 4 pi cube i yeah yeah you are correct c is the correct option that we have uh, obtained for this uh, question yeah so so that's that um yeah just uh, so so as as i was talking earlier that there are two approaches of uh, finding the residues so, so that that's what I was coming to here in the previous question because uh, the the pole was at uh, where was it? Yeah, the pole was at z equal to zero, and so this expression could we we already knew that expansion for e to the power one by z, and so it was fairly simple just to write this. Uh, it was a, it was a better approach to write the expansion for uh, the exponential over here rather than. Uh, going through the in the the limit thing and we simply could just find the coefficient of 1 over z minus z naught z naught was 0 so so that was the approach over there here since there are first of all in this problem since there are two poles which we have identified uh, yeah first we first uh, this is a key thing when oh, when um, uh, exponents because in complex uh, this is sometimes this happens that uh, odd 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 multiples or even multiples for trigonometric terms so this this is a fairly common feature and you have to you have to be careful about it because if you take only one pole then the answer will be different so first we have what we had done we have identified the poles and mind you inside the contour first we find out all the poles that are there and then uh, we try to find out that which one of them which ones of them fall inside the contour so we could see that only two of them out of the infinite uh, um, poles were falling inside the contour and then we then we try to find the residue so but we did not use the taylor series approach because what we saw that the that the because then we have to expand it along the uh, these two terms and we have to write this expression twice and it, it will increase your steps that's all in time uh, but but uh, but what we did was that we, we went for an alternate approach in this case which was to find the limits and once we wrote the limits and then this was a zero by zero form you can see if we put z equal to i pi so zero and this denominator will also come out to zero because it was a pole for this right and this is a simple pole that's how we could do this. if there are if there are uh, okay i should clarify this even further so a simple pole is a first order pole what that means is that this is the form of z minus z naught raised to the power one where z naught is the pole right and there may be other poles z minus z1 raised to the power 1 so z naught and z1 are simple poles however if there is z minus z2 raised to the power 3 let's say this is not a simple pole this is a pole of order 3 so for instance which we saw in the last uh, last problem over here z equal to 0 was not a simple pole you can see there will be z uh, sorry it's 2 z square and there will be uh, 3 factorial z cube so you see that the the z keeps on increasing and then the the power of z keeps on increasing so here z is not a simple pole so that that's a key difference in this however it was a simple pole however what what shall we do if it's not a simple pole it's simple so what we do is that if it's not a simple pole i'll write this expression here limits z equal to z naught z minus z naught to the power n and there's also a differential term here sorry factorial yeah and then you try to find this term mm. uh, and the whatever the function whatever the function that you have so try to evaluate this okay 
and i think there's a differential also so um yeah. sir uh, differential with respect to n next part uh, yeah in this over here right d by d z to okay. the power n yeah so so that's the form that we take that's and that's for the case of uh, higher order poles but for first order differential term will vanish because we're talking only the first term so 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 these are the important things and i, I again emphasize that uh, Uh, thank you for correcting by the way I, i had forgotten about this thing so so these are the things that while we while we talk about um, the residue theorem uh, and the and finding the integrals so so not only this there are some uh, some even more complicated problems can be formed so for instance i remember so uh, there is something like you take this contour when you try to find evaluate the integral on some real axis right So try to see some previous year problems. That's my suggestion. Like you want to find the integral over all or or only on this, but you can find use this contour integral to evaluate some expressions which 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 uh, just by doing the real com uh, real integral analysis you will not be able to do easily that easily. The algebra will be very much complicated there. But if you but if you employ the the um, the the complex analysis, especially the the residue theorem that we have talked about over here. it simplifies uh, things to a, to to a great extent simplifies and uh, yeah so that's the whole idea and you can evaluate some very complicated integrals also all right so so that's it about the 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 residue theorem from my side um, i'll again pause for a for a minute or so because we have talked about two different approaches um there are other i think there is a one more I'm, i'm not able to recall but i think there is at least uh, one more approach to find the residues uh, the taylor series is also i think called the taylor lorentz series because taylor series is usually what we see only in the positive powers of z or x whatever it is but for uh, but for when the when the powers is in um, uh, the, the, let's say when the power is in negative like we saw 1 by z plus 1 by 2 factorial z square and so on those are also called the uh, taylor lorentz series if i am not mistaken the complete uh, the combined picture is is known as that so it's good to remember some 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 of the 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 common um, how should i say this the common expressions the common expansions that's really helpful all right uh, so that's about the uh, residue theorem uh, any comments any doubts any questions regarding this okay yes, sir okay so, sir uh, how many more questions uh we are what's the time so we are actually out of time i had one more but uh, if you have any doubts then you can ask because i don't think i'll be able to complete it in, in two minutes uh, thank you for thank your you time. sir yeah best of luck goodbye sir uh, yeah. if i have any doubts how can i okay oh, sorry i forgot to mention that me so, lady yeah, it's yeah. possible yeah Just one second. Yeah, you can. Uh, it's learn with Amit Bansal at gmail dot com. You can email me on this, and I'll try to reply as soon as possible. I've written in the chat box. Can you see? Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Welcome. Goodbye. Thank you for your time.